perspective is on killer rebuttal. Um, we're going to look at two areas. We're going to look firstly at what arguments you should be attacking, and secondly, we're going to look at how you can attack them most effectively. Um, and the idea behind all of this, as you can tell from the name killer rebuttal, is I want to develop your killer instincts. Okay? I want you going into debate, uh, really wanting to draw blood, wanting to have this kind of uh, instinct that you want to find the jugular and you want to go for it, you know, really like a rock violer or a dangerous dog. Um, you really want to, to be kind of destructive when it comes to rebuttal. Now that doesn't mean that you're being uh, nasty to the, any other people in the room. What I'm talking about is an intellectual destruction of arguments. It's all done at that level um, of argumentation in that way. We would never um, advocate anyone uh, being aggressive towards people, towards individual speakers in that sense, or to be nasty or mean or ridiculing towards people. But I would recommend all of those things towards arguments. Why do I think it's so important with re uh, rebuttal to, to be looking to destroy, to really have that kind of um, destructive tendencies? Well, I think when we think about a debate, we think sometimes we, we forget what we're doing and when we think all we're trying to do is to convince a judge to give us a particular position um, in a debate about it. But if we remember what a debate is really about, it's the idea that there is an audience present who are having two sides of a case put to them. And you really, really want the audience to vote for your side of the case at the end. Okay, so if it's in Parliament, you really want people to vote for the government to go through the eye lobby so that that law actually gets passed. And on the opposition, you really want them uh, to, to go through the no lobby uh, and not pass that. So, so you're really trying to persuade this audience. And it seems to just make sense to me that if you're trying to persuade your audience to vote for your side, then in the same way that you have to put everything possible into persuading them that you are right, you also need to put everything possible into persuading them that they are wrong. Okay? So that it's not a kind of simple evaluation of, we've been really, really good, and we're going to tell you how good we are. And they say, we've been really good, and we're going to tell you how good we are. And then leave it to chance, <coughs> and they decide. You want to be more kind of active in it in that sense. You want to show them why really your side, not only uh, has these great constructive arguments, but has the only great constructive arguments in the debate, or the only significant great constructive arguments in the debate in that sense. So I think having that mindset of, of wanting to defeat uh, the motion or get the motion passed in that way uh, really helps you to be thinking and training your mind in the way you listen in, and the way you speak and the way you phrase things in the right way. Uh, but with that kind of principle in, intact, this idea that, um, that we're really wanting our side to win and that we need to be uh, quite aggressive to get that done, we need to say we need to think firstly about which arguments we're going to prioritise attacking. Um, what's going to get most of our time, perhaps as the debate goes on, which ones are we actually going to drop and let go in the debate, and which ones do we have to keep on going at um, in, in that way, now that you know we've got the kind of, the, the dog's got its prey in its teeth, it wants to kind of like shake it around a bit to make sure that, uh, uh, that it's really as dead as it possibly can be in that sense. Um, and I think there are, are ways that we can, uh, principles we can apply to think about how um, we we to prioritise arguments in a sense. I want to give you a sense of a hierarchy of things to think about um, with um, within the debate and things to attack. Um, now, firstly, there's one that almost comes outside of the hierarchy that of uh, what we're talking about. So I put it at the top because it's not quite the same as as the other ones, which are all about the arguments in a debate. I put it at the top of the hierarchy um, that you're going to attack um, ways in which. The, um, the debate is not being done as it, as it should be in that sense. So for an example, um, a, a significant contradiction on the other side. If there's a really big contradiction on the other side, you want to point it out, you don't want to let it slide. You want to, it's usually a way of kind of showing that they're not producing consistent um, analysis for, um, for what they're, they're doing. So in the display debate we saw, you know, Sam gave a point of information to say, well, what is this? Do you think we're supporting the status quo, or do you think we're fundamentally changing um, all of Western law? In that sense, picking up on, on contradictions, and they're really effective um, attacks. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes a contradiction is a knife between two teams. It's even worse if it's um, a contradiction between the two speakers on the same team. Sometimes, 
what you need to do is point it out. Not a contradiction. Sometimes it's not that some two things really come to actually can't work together. But sometimes as a debate goes on, by the time you hear the position of the whip speaker, it doesn't really seem to have very much in common with the position of the first speaker that you hear. Because it's, it, it's, we've had a slide as the debate starts. <coughs> and this normally happens in two directions. One, the first uh, speaker starts off with something pretty bo uh, bold and ballsy in what they put forward. They take a relatively extreme position. And then as the opposition attack that extreme position, the proposition responds to that by becoming a little bit more moderate with every speech that it goes down. Well, of course we don't really need X. And we're only talking about this. What do you mean? Until by the end of the debate, you can really see and really effectively point out that they haven't been able to keep to that uh, consistent initial position. The other way it happens is exactly the other way around. The team start off um, arguing for something pretty uh, small, you know, they, something quite modest in what they want to achieve, or a, a relatively moderate standpoint. And again, as it gets attacked and attacked, the, it becomes stronger and stronger um, as, the, as the debate goes down in that sense. We were um, in a debate um, on Georgia um, where uh, we started off the debate with some quite moderate and realistic claims about the way that Russia might attack. And by the end of the debate, it's like, but they're proposing all out nuclear war and the destruction of mankind forever. Okay? So think about watching. Is, is there a consistency in, um, in the line? Have, have there been contradictions or have there been slides? And it's, it's always good to point those things out as kind of the top um, form of attack. Underneath that, though, becomes not so much about how um, arguments are interplaying with each other in the debates, but, but arguments as they stand in their own right within a debate. And there are different types of arguments, and there are different arguments you have to attack. And at the top of the hierarchy, you've got this idea of um, fundamental premises that a proposition team or an opposition team rely on in order to get their case passed. Okay, an argument is like a foundation to the case. And if you take away that foundation, everything else falls. So, for example, um, in a, um, a, um, a debate about the environment, um, the proposition identify a particular environmental problem. Okay, if the opposition attack the existence of that environmental problem, then everything else falls down because everything else the proposition wants to say is about how uh, we should look after the environment, this is an effective way of looking after the environment in that way. So it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental foundation argument. Sometimes they're more principled, sometimes they're not practical in that sense. So for example, in a debate on um, uh, banning intensive farming or banning animal testing, the proposition might start off with an initial notion of animals having rights and the rest of the arguments being based on an idea of upholding those rights in some sense. So again, if you attack the idea that animals have rights in the first place, then that's a, a foundation argument. Now those arguments hopefully come out early in the debate from the, from the beginning, and they need to be attacked full on. I mean, in that environmental debate, I'm not saying that you always have to accept there's not a problem with the environment in the environment debate. You might choose to, to go with an argument in that case that some, because something working is also a fundamental argument, yeah? If someone says, you know, we, we believe this works, and so we've now what we want to talk about is the five brilliant advantages it has. Well, if you can show that it doesn't work, then all of those advantages disappear. So it might not be that you attack a problem, it might be that you attack the idea that a solution will ever solve the problem. Again, House of Cards falls down um, in that sense. So attack those arguments. Put your attacks to those arguments up front, make sure you've got enough time for them. And as the debate goes on, don't drop them. Okay, don't, as the side goes on, don't like let those things go. You want to keep on hammering them down the idea that their, their side, their motion cannot possibly be passed. Because on this big basic argument, they failed. Now we can then play even if games, and say, look, we're going to show even if that wasn't the case. They, they're losing on all the rest of their arguments as well. You need to be able to recognise what those arguments are that they have to prove in order to win the debate. And which your side, when I say win the debate, I don't mean win the judges, like in that sense, I mean win the motion, you know, win the side of the motion. In that sense. So keep those, those focused and those in mind. And again, in the summary speeches, 
those ideas, those kind of foundation ideas should should always be come up um, and, they, and, and be, be pushed forward because it's showing the audience they're going to vote, why they can't possibly vote for the other side. Second then, underneath those ideas of those key foundation arguments that they have to prove in order to win the debate. Or I should say, like before we move on from that actually, sometimes they don't even try and make the arguments. So sometimes your rebuttal is to their invisible assumption. Right? So if we're in, that in um, the debate where I say attacking the foundation might be attacking that something works, it might not be that the first proposition speaker has put forward an argument that it will be effective or that it will work. So you're rebutting something invisible, you're rebutting the lack of an argument and the lack of that foundation being there. And that can be a really effective thing to do as well. So you're rebutting what's not said as well as what's said in that situation. Do you not run the risk of being accused of like putting words in their mouth, though? Well, for example, so especially, especially if you do it even more effectively. Imagine you're in a situation where um, um, it's, uh, you've got a motion. It's this house would assassinate dictators, <coughs> and the first proposition speaker uh, stands up, says we'd assassinate dictators um, because dictators are um, evil, dictatorial regimes are evil. We think we should stop at nothing in order to. Um, remove them um, and, and, replace, and have democracies in their place instead. Um, and as a result, we think it's justified to kill people. That's the end of your first problem. Okay. All of that is based on the idea that assassinating a dictator will mean that a dictatorial regime falls and a democracy is put in its place. So it's completely okay for you to say the same opposition. Like, our main problem with this is the fact that we don't think that it will lead to what, um, what you just asserted it will lead to. We never heard from you the analysis of why this will lead. This is what we think would actually happen if you assassinated a dictator instead. We think another head would have You see what I mean? So it's yeah, not putting yeah. words in their mouth. It's pointing out that the assumptions that they base their argument on, they've never proved in that way. So, um, yeah. Like, on the point of rebutting something that wasn't really there, if you're first opposition and first government doesn't do, doesn't do anything, you have to, as first opposition, stand up, okay, this is the things that they could do, either this or this, because of the, I don't know, for the sake of the debate, we choose that and we negate it like this. Um, I mean, you have to set the whole debate on. Yeah, I think sometimes if you have a situation, if the first government doesn't, the prime minister doesn't define what they mean by the debate, and you therefore have, you're not sure exactly what it is you're attacking in that way, I think that sometimes you can do that either or thing. Or if the motion is something uh, uh, put on uh, one job of the government, like this you have to do and they don't do it, like uh, the motion asks for some active uh, action, for some active plan, and they go on principle, you can, you can say this or not? I don't know. I don't think you should put it in, but I think that you should, so like say um, um, you're making something, the, the debate calls for you to make something illegal, um, and the proposition um, doesn't really, just doesn't sort of put in any parameters in that sense, and they don't tell you anything about um, the punishment. I, what I don't think the opposition should do is say, well they haven't told us anything about the punishment, so we assume it's going to be life imprisonment, and that's what we're going to argue against, because I don't think that would be fair. But I think what they can say is, we haven't heard from the proposition what the punishment is going to be. And we really need to know this, because there's one of two possibilities. Either they want a, a really punitive um, response, like a prison, in which case we think that that would be an unacceptable um, uh, overreaction and disproportionate, or they're just going to want something like a fine or a slap on the wrist. In which case, we don't think it's going to act as an effective deterrent. So, whatever this punishment is that we haven't heard, we, you know, we need to know what it is before we can attack it in that way. So, you can almost put forward an idea of recognizing that they, it's you, you haven't got some crucial information and showing why why it matters and putting both the arguments forward. So, when you point out that something is missing in Prime Minister's speech, you have to. Explain why it's key or why it's crucial for your case. Yeah, absolutely. What you don't want to do is that you think that there's like a like a good benefit of um of the debate and they don't run it. So you just say, well, you, you came up with all of these arguments, but you failed to run the really good argument about how it really benefits kids. So now I'll rebut that one. You know, it's not about it's not about um, providing them with arguments. It's that there are certain things. If you want an audience to support something 
that have to be there. And there are sometimes unspoken assumptions that arguments are built on, and you can definitely draw out those assumptions and, and attack them and show why uh, why the proposition hasn't done everything that they've needed to in order to prove a case in that sense. Um, so yeah, once you've got this kind of idea of, of looking for the assumptions, the foundation arguments um, in that sense, you've got a, another range of arguments which are kind of additional benefits arguments. Okay. Now the, the opening government team might not, or whoever the team is you're rebutting, aren't necessarily going to label their arguments in these sorts of ways. They might do. I think it's really a nice thing to do in that sense. But they might not do. So it's kind of up to you to work out whether or not an argument if, you, if they lose that argument, if the House of Cards falls down, or whether or not you could actually pick that card out, pick that gender stick out. And it's great that you've got that stick, but the tower's still standing in that way. Okay? So, and the kind of question you need to ask yourself in that way is, if they lose that argument, if I comprehensively beat that argument, could they stand up and say, even if we do lose that argument, we don't say we do, but even if we do, we still win the debate because of this. You can't do that with a foundation argument. You lose the foundation argument, you lose the, the, you know, the motion falls, or, the, you, um, or on the opposition, the motion passes. But there are other arguments which just add to and build and strengthen on that power, which you can remove, and it's good to remove, you want to remove them, but you don't want to prioritise them above the more key um, issues of, of the fundamentals in that sense. Um, so for example, um, some things cost a lot of money, and it's completely legitimate in some debates to bring up arguments about why we would or wouldn't do something because of the cost involved. It's unlikely that if they, if you lose the um, the, the expenses argument, the money argument, that, that you're going to lose the, the whole debate. In that because most people, so for example, in um, a debate about um, supporting capital punishment, a team might make an argument about how capital punishment actually saves the state money um, because it's cheaper than having people in prison for their whole life. Okay? But you don't, that's not the reason. Yeah? No one's out there saying we really need to bring back capital punishment to save money. Okay? It's, not a fun, it's not a fundamental argument. It's something that says, given that we really think we have to have um, capital punishment because of our principles of deterrent and retribution or whatever the principles are, we've got this advantage that it's also going to bring that's going to save us money. So we don't think we should be wasting this money. But, they, but it's a built-on argument in that way. It's an additional benefit. So hit the additional benefits, but hit them quickly and make sure you don't, they don't, you don't prioritise them over the more important arguments. And additional benefits, depending on how big they are, if they've been made and they've been hit, you might not necessarily bring them sort of back. Or in a summary speech, they might get a sentence or two where you kind of say, and, and we showed you why um, their issue of money um, isn't important because, um, because we can't put a price on, on human life. And we showed you why their issue of court time um, really isn't, it isn't an issue, again, because resources just aren't as significant as thinking about the principles of justice. So you could maybe just bring them back in in a kind of sentence way but not give them any priority in that sense. So underneath, yes. So when you attack like the fundamental premises and stuff, right? How much detail do you have to apply them to? Because I've often got accused, uh, like, uh, critiqued about the fact that I attacked their premise, but I didn't then apply that offense to each single argument and how that premise relates. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's going to depend on the particular debate and, and how the particular premise um, fits into um, into the debate. I think that um, spend as much time and detail as you need to attacking a premise because there's such a big prize at the end of it. Yeah, the prize if you if you if you get one of those premise arguments is the Jenga tower coming now. Um, so uh, don't skimp on it in that sense. Um, do what you think you need to do to, to hammer it home um, in that way. Um, so yeah, so we've got our kind of contradiction slides, we've got our premise arguments or assumption arguments, um, we've got additional benefits. Um, underneath additional benefits, um, we've got examples. Or any type of sort of evidence here. Examples, um, analogies, um, statistical studies. Really 
it's only worth hitting examples to the extent that you've already hit the logic of the argument. Okay? Because most of the time, you can lose an example and still win the argument. Someone can say, okay, you know, they're, they're right. Um, it, maybe they're right. We don't say they're right, but maybe they're right in that case in Iraq. But we're still right in Iran and Afghanistan and North Korea. So you have to attack the, the logic of an argument before you ever get anywhere near attacking the example in that sense. Because you're always trying to think of that thing of, well, how is, am I, am I using my time well? Am I using my time to is actually undermining the motion or is actually upholding the motion in that sense? So examples um, shouldn't be rebutted in and of themselves apart from the logic. So you can see those situations and it happens in so many debates where the judges and the audience just kind of get perplexed by the fact that the thing that seems to stay in the debate and go back and forth and get time in like seven speeches seems to be whether or not an example is a good or bad example on an argument that isn't even a key argument within the debate. And it's just become a sort of obsession within the debate and nobody's stepping back and prioritising and thinking about being the person who'll stand up and say, you know what? Even if this example was not in this debate, even if they win the example, we win this because. So let's not hear any more about this example. And this, I hope that the idea of this hierarchy is to give you that sense of when, when you're spending the, your time on the wrong premise. In that sense. Sometimes it might be worth. I should say this. It's it, it is a, a hierarchy, but um, sometimes you, it might you might end up attacking an example of an assumption argument before you attack an additional benefit. Because again, what we said about the prize being so high with an assumption argument, if there's an example integral to their assumption argument, then hit that before, prioritise hitting that before you prioritise hitting an additional benefit. Um, underneath examples, even, um, are the, 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 the spurious, irrelevant, insignificant, things that sometimes come into debates. So I'm not even going to give them the, the, um, the, the luxury, the, uh, the respect of calling them an additional benefit. Because really they're not even, they're not even a small strengthening argument. They're a complete red herring and irrelevancy that kind of pop up um, in a debate in this sense. Um, and they're the most frustrating of all for judges to see. And I'm going to use one from um, a debate that I've seen this week, because it's always good when uh, you, can, you can use things that you've seen very recently. Um, we're having a debate on the motion this house um, would pay a salary to stay at home parents. And somewhere in the debate, somebody makes an argument that um, they don't like um, paying a salary to stay at home parents because it's communist, and they don't like communism quite high up in the debate, uh, first opposition I think to myself. We then get, well, why is communism such a bad thing? Maybe communism is actually a good thing. You know? Communism is not a good thing. What about like Mao and Stalin? Okay. But Mao and Stalin, it's not really communism that you don't like about them, right? It's the fact that they're dictatorial. And you're kind of sitting there as a judge being like, <laughs> People are spending time on this. No one's thinking about, if I win the communism argument, does that communism good or bad argument, does that in any way help me winning a, an argument about whether or not we should have stay-at-home parents? And I'm not, um, you know, I'm not just kind of having a go at anyone in that debate, because debates take on a life of their own, and these things happen all the time. Like, that's an example that I have from this week, but it's really often, and judges find it really frustrating. And again, the point of the hierarchy is just to give you that sense of, do you want to talk about anything that you really don't think in the, in the end you care about that's going to impact the debate? And this hierarchy, again, as I say, is really useful in the summary speeches, because it's another one of those things you're probably not going to want to have as one of your big clash points at the end of the debate on paying the salaries to stay-at-home parents. The first big clash point in the debate, is communism good or bad? <laughs> you know, um, you use the, use the hierarchy to also think about how you're going to um, attack them in a, in a whole way um, at the end of the debate as well. Like, what do you do if you're a whip speaker and a thing like that, irrelevant, is speaking like for, I don't know, how many minutes in a debate? Do you yeah. take it in a video speech or...? Yeah, you, you probably can't ignore it if it really has dominated the debate. <laughs> what it kind of looks like yeah. on the other side. As, as long as your partner hasn't spent too long, <laughs> <laughs> then you can, yeah. you can do what you want. You can, you can sort of say, like, 
first thing that I have to deal with this issue about communism because a lot of people in the debate seem to think it's really important and we won it because, you know, or just to say, I think we comprehensively won the issue about how communism was a bad thing. <laughs> um, but, um, but really now we want to talk about these issues. If your partner's got dragged into it, then you maybe, you can't make them look really bad in that sense. Um, so you maybe kind of say, um, you know, we had to spend a little bit of time addressing uh, this random issue in the debate of, of, of communism. And my partner won that argument, but really we want to talk about the more significant issues that we brought up. So don't pretend it didn't exist in that case, if it really has dominated the debate, but um, don't get dragged into it either. Try, to, to try go away. Yeah, yeah distance yourself from yeah. it. Um, <clears throat> when you encounter such insignificant points, is it better to just to just ignore them or say something uh, or say that they're rele irrelevant and move on? Um, I think probably the second one because as soon as you attack it, someone else then wants to attack your attack of it, and it's really it's this kind of idea of you're not you are there for a purpose. As I say, you are there to get emotion passed or emotion defeated, and if something's going on in the debate that's got nothing to do with a relation should get past the pieces, then it's not your job to, to deal with it, and apart from to show why it's not relevant. Uh, it's always good to look at the chat, because if somebody said something stupid, Jesha always goes like, what? Yeah. And if you see that reaction, you know that you can make fun of it, like, oh, this is completely not relevant, and you know that your judge is going to be on but your side. It depends so. on the judge. Some judges have yeah. like poker face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really strange. Yeah, but somebody says something like that, it's always a reaction. I know a judge who, who, who like, when you're talking crap, really silly things, he, he, he's doing like this. And, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of judges are like, you know, <laughs> let's not make them nervous, let's be friendly, let's be conducive to not yeah. making them fear about this TV. Okay, well, let's think about the second yeah, half of this then. Now we've got this idea of Brand identifying. Like identifying the jugular, which has been the first half of this idea, really seeing where you can get to them, okay? Because you don't want to be like throwing all these punches and kind of missing in the end. You want to know straight where, um, you know, where the jugular is so you can go at it with your teeth as, as quickly as possible. So we've identified the jugular, we understand like where, um, where we need to focus on. And the second part, we're going to talk about how we can most effectively make the kill. Now we know uh, where we're hitting it, and that's it. And um, mainly this is about your mindset, what you set out to do, and the language that you use to do it. And this is only one way of doing robotics, I should say this at the beginning. Everyone does have their own approaches and their own styles, and some people might not you know, feel that it suits them or their intellectual way of seeing things to go for a, for a really aggressive um, rebuttal in that sense. And, and it's perfectly possible to do rebuttal well without doing this. But this is, this is one idea um, that, that you can go for that can be really effective if you feel comfortable um, using it in, in that sense. So where's the line between that like you're not too uh, aggressive? Well, I, I, what, what I, was, I think that comes back to what I was saying at the beginning uh, of the debate, which uh, of this session, which is that any aggression towards another speaker risks going over that line. Some, in some situations, when everyone's friends and the judge know it's like okay, but like I would always try to never be aggressive towards another speaker. But I don't think that there is such a thing as being too aggressive towards somebody's argument. Like it's an argument; it doesn't have to be. Okay, you can you can rip it apart, and and no one's gonna get hurt. That way. Um, so so yeah, how how do we really kind of atta attack an argument if, if we want to in that sense? And I think this really goes down the idea that there's two ways that you can can look at, at rebuttal. You can look at rebuttal and you can say, uh, the speaker before me said X, um, but what we say is Y. And put forward like an alternative to their argument. And I think this is the most common form of rebuttal that you see um, in, in any debate. You know, they say it will lead to this, we say it will lead to Y. That's our rebuttal. That's fine, yeah? You're putting forward an alternative in that way. Um, I don't think there's going to be blood spurting from uh, the vein at that point. The reason being is what you're saying in that situation is like, well, they say this, we say this. Now, audience judges, you make up your own mind about which argument you think is better. 
We think our one's better, so, and we really hope, therefore, that you'll agree with us. Now, I think you can try and have been more active in the game than that, okay? They say this, and this is what they, why what they just said is wrong. This is why what they just said is morally unacceptable. This is why what they said does not correspond to the real world. Before you go on to that bit, which is where you say, and actually, we see that what it really is, is this, and added it. But that bit in the middle, when you don't accept that they've put forward something fine and, and now you're going to put forward your alternative, but you actually want to have a go at their argument in an attack way first before you put forward your own argument, that's when you start doing what I call killer rebuttal in that sense, when you're actually trying to destroy. You're not just trying to offer an alternative, you're trying to, um, to actually break down an argument. A few things to say about this. Firstly, whichever one of those methods you're going for, it's always helpful to flag up the argument that you're attacking before you um, attack it. Okay, so you say, you know, that key bit where you say, they said, before you say what you're going to say. It's a small thing, but it's, it makes it so much easier for the judges, and it means you get that direct hit on the argument. Because if you're just saying, I'm starting my rebuttal now, my first piece of rebuttal is, and I'm not quite sure what it's a rebuttal to, I have to... Um, a little bit of me is not listening to your point because I'm trying to work out what point it is you're rebutting in that sense. So make it clear what you're attacking. Do you, have a Do you think it's, it's preferable to either like be like ruthless in your condemnation of it, not necessarily aggressive, but just like un unwavering in your condemnation of it, or is it more effective to be like, this is actually a very smart argument, which I which which you know has some credence, but the tragedy is that it fails on this level. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it can be in that sense the, the bit in which you're attacking is the, the tragic way in which it's failed. Like, I, I'd still say that was quite aggressive to say that something has tragically failed. I think that's much more aggressive than saying, they said this, we say this. Like, it's that idea of are you actually, you know, showing what's wrong with their argument rather than just saying, well, you've got two choices, everyone. There's two things on tonight's menu. They've offered you beef, but we're offering you pork. So, you know, we hope that you go for... For us, you know, they offered you beef, and we've had, you know, we've had a look at it. That it's really horrible and disgusting. I don't even want to eat it. I'm bored. Um, <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's trying to just stack the the odds um, a bit more in your favour. Yeah, and that doesn't, as as um, as we said, that doesn't always have to mean using um, uh, using really aggressive language. Although it often does, and it can often be effective to do that. But the key thing is, what are you actually saying? How are you actually showing that that argument has, has failed um, in some way or another? Yeah. Can you rebut, like, first you, you, you are going on X, then on link, and then on Y? What do you mean? Like, first you attack their, their stance, and then on link. On link with the motion, the link with the argument with the motion. And then on the, the what come out, like, from uh, slits. Consequences. Consequences. Yeah, all of those are, are valid all ways of, of attacking an argument, definitely. Um, all you know, three, th three things in one, one. Yeah, maybe. If it's, I mean, don't do that if it's a small additional benefit. <laughs> Pick one, get it out of the way quickly. But if you're really thinking this is key, if I, if I can nail this argument, like I win the debate, then do as many different even ifs and combinations and showing why the, lo the, the logic isn't right, but even if the logic was right, it still wouldn't be true because of X. And, you know, go, go to town, show, um, show that an argument is wrong in as, as many ways um, as, as, you, as you think is necessary, given the prioritization and the time that you have um, in, in that situation. So yeah, label your argument that you're going to attack. Um, and, and try and say something negative to it before you move on to give it um, to give it your own response. So have a go. Okay, I'm going to give you an argument, and I want you to think um, about this one. I don't even want you to go on to the bit where you put forward an alternative. I just want to do the bit where you make everyone in the room think, you know, wow, that that uh, that Debbie, I can't believe she made that argument because you know that argument's like really bad. Like it's really sort of stupid, or it's really outrageous, or it's really morally bankrupt, or whatever it is. Um, they're they're going to think about me. I'm going to be sort of, you know, squirming uncomfortably um, as the, the true horror of what I've said is made clear to me. Um, okay, what I can show you. 
Um, okay, uh, let's say the argument is um, the motion is that we're going to ban gambling. And I'm the opening speaker for the opposition. And I'm going to put forward an argument about um, how um, I should be free to spend my money however I want to. Okay, and you're going to attack attack me on those on, on that ground. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, on to um, my next argument about how I, sh I earn my own money and I should have a right to spend it how I want to, and a, the government shouldn't be telling me what I do on a Saturday night or how I spend my money. And what I say behind this is there are all sorts of things that I might spend my money on and that might spend too much money on, that might make me poor, that, might, that I might spend money on rather than spending money on my children, but I'm still allowed to do it. So if I want to use a lot of my wages to go out and buy really expensive shoes um, or to buy tickets to a really expensive concert, I'm allowed to do that because it's my money, it's not the government's money. The government takes some of my money from me in tax and the rest of the money is mine to do with as I see fit. And yes, gambling, when I go gambling, I might lose a lot of money. I might lose thousands of pounds doing that. But it is only my money that I'm going to lose and it is only uh, me that's going to be harmed in that way. So I don't think anyone should intervene uh, and tell me that I don't know how best to spend my money and that I'm not going to have the right to pursue the leisure activities that I want to um, in the way that I want to. So the argument we have seen is that people should be lent to spend money as however they want to because it's their money. But they forgot to see that actually spending money in gambling makes them addictive into gambling. And addiction is something that government is trying to prevent because they're going to not only spend all the money that they have, the addiction is going to lead them to spend more money than they have. So they're going to uh, destroy their lives in making their debts deeper and deeper day by day, destroying their families, destroying their lives. And this cannot be connected to, I don't know, shopping shoes or, sho or going to the concert because shoes does not make you addictive, even though you may be need them or not and it I don't and concert does not make you addictive so because the addiction factor we cannot uh, let people spend money on gambling good how much blood do we think she got she can do better I know <laughs> <laughs> um, you know I think she got I think she got some blood there there was some um, some direct um, attacks on on um, how I was putting the argument together and um, the, the, the examples and analogies that I was using and why they didn't work in that way. Um, how would we prepare this rebuttal in several levels? Like on the first level you would say that gambling is not the same as spending money on, on, not, on buying shoes. The second level is that gambling creates addiction. Do you want to have a go? No, I'm, I'm just commenting this. I think I know, sometimes it's better to see see the argument and see how much see how much blood you can get. Like I, I'm just I have the problem with preparing the rebuttal on several levels. It's just yeah. one way. I'm yeah, it's fine. Just going to say, firstly, our first problem with this, you know. Secondly, moreover, like yeah, I have different different ways of. of uh, how would we here go with, for example, when you come in? Uh, well, first you have to like uh, prove that it's, uh, yeah, that it's, it's not about around. spending money. You know, banning gambling isn't about spending money, even if it was. Then yeah. So you can admit that you have the right to spend money free, but if I think if we want to do this, I want people to have a go at doing the argument, because what I want, what I'm really interested in here is getting like how we can actually do this in a way that you know looks like that rock violet with the. Uh, you know, small child in its mouth. Uh, it's not a small child, it's <laughs> 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 <laughs>
apologies to the camera for uh, <laughs> uh, the Rottweiler with the small animal in its mouth, uh, really kind of uh, trying to make sure it gets every shred uh, uh, that it can out of it. You want to have a go? Sure. I think I should just say, I don't think you should just do you need, say need me to stand up? I do need you to stand up. We always stand up when we speak. Lucas, can we uh, have the camera? So, when the opening speaker um, says that we have the right to spend our money wherever we want, they don't really justify this right as being an absolute right when they ignore the fact that we do buy the purchase of certain things like drugs, which are addictive, or, or, or even alcohol up to a certain age and things like that. So we do acknowledge we don't have an uh, absolute right to spend our money wherever we want. But even if we were to grant them that we do have this absolute right, the problem is that when it comes to gambling, they're not necessarily spending their own money, but they're accumulating debt, which is then government's money borrowed by these people who are then not able to pay this money back, and the, the government has to take up the debt, then these people fight for bankruptcy. So we say that on both those grounds, this argument just is not valid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> so in order to fully show why the argument presented by our dear coach, Debbie Newman, simply fails, I need to take you uh, through two logical steps. The first thing we need to establish is in what kind of terms and in what kind of situations are our rights being disregarded and in what kind of terms and situations we simply do not have all the freedom we can. Uh, these situations are when our rights disregard the, uh, the rights of others or if the rights we have essentially hurt ourselves. And we say that that is the case here because when we spend thousands and thousands of money, this is essentially the money of our families, of ourselves, we say that at the end of the day it is ourselves we are hurting. So the next logical step here is that we say it is justified for the state to intervene in re the relationship you have with yourself and thus say that it is unjustified for you to spend so much money on something so frivolous as gambling. Because at the end of the day, the state is trying to protect you from yourself. Um, okay, I'm gonna have a go then at um, at doing some some rebuttal back. Can you rebuttal yourself? Well, no, I'm not gonna. I, I can rebuttal myself. I'm gonna have a go at at, um, at imagining that I'm now the second opposition speaker, um, and I want to um, rebut um, what we've heard um, so far. So the speakers that we've heard so far have tried to tell us that actually no, the government can step in and stop us spending our money on what we want. And we had examples here of how, for example, we can't spend our money on drugs. But in this situation, it's not that we can't, the reason that drugs aren't Ill are illegal isn't because we might lose all of our money on them. It's because the drugs themselves are harmful in a way that harm our health. We say that's not true with gambling. The only potential harm of gambling is losing the money in exactly the same way that you'd lose the money if you bought four pairs of really expensive shoes. And that's why we say that when we're told, um, oh, but it's, we'd stop them from doing this because it'll be bad for their family when this money is diverted away from their family, or it'll be bad for the government when they go bankrupt and we have to go into debt. What they are saying is, yes, we should stop people from getting into debt. We should criminalise debt, and we should criminalise people being able to spend their money on shoes or anything else which diverts money away from their family. But we say that's not the principle we live by, because in a free society, we do allow people to spend their money as they want. Now, we have one more point, which is somehow that there isn't freedom involved in this because gambling is addictive. But first, we say that it's entirely assertive. Um, gambling for the vast majority of people will go to casinos and will play poker online, will be able to do that as a, a legitimate leisure activity that they enjoy, recognising that they might lose money in that and being willing to do that. And they can make that decision and we shouldn't stop them. If there is a tiny percentage, like less than 1% of people who might become um, addicted to gambling, then let's provide support and help through that, through things like Gambling Anonymous and Gambling Support. That's not a reason to criminalise the 99% of people who want to spend their money in this fashion. Um, does anyone want to have a go then at coming back at that? Now we're getting into, you know... <laughs> Well, actually, uh, I've got some point. I mean that, for example, if we're taking argument by the taxes because we have a consumer index that consists of like uh, spending money on the goods or services, 
but how the percentage, percentage of money are going to the taxes that are like uh, divided from the, for example, pension fund or for example, like salaries or insurance and so on and so forth. So if people are not spending money, I mean like buying the certain goods or services, they're not spending money on the taxes, that's why they are not uh, gonna have in the future like the correct pensions and so on and so forth. So uh, it's like the alternative of spending money as you've said, like uh, when you buy shoes, that's the difference because there we can't receive all those uh, welfare in the future. That's why it's the government should gambling tax. Yeah, gambling is yes, actually very heavily taxed. Isn't it? But still, yeah, well, it's well, yeah. it's tax. 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 The tax. government probably gets more money when you gamble yeah. than when you buy a shoe. No, I think it's essentially tough to attack it because it's freedom of choice. But yeah, but, 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 yeah, but yeah. it's. it's so it, we, we need I mean, to attack I'll, I'll give it a shot. I wasn't planning on it, but you want to go? No, you can go. go nuts. Yeah, you, you I've already gone. Okay. Um, um, does someone want to put the camera on, Lucas? I think that's cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, watch out, because that thing zoomed in. I don't know that much detail. Um, okay, so <laughs> I think that one of the wrong and false assertions that you're making is that people make a choice to gamble. And I think this is something that is a legend and it's a myth and it's not true. I think the, the, and the fact that there are compulsive gamblers who do not have the choice to stop gambling. And I think that you're free to dismiss this as not real and in such small minorities. Where, in, for example, in America, there are millions of people who are compulsive gamblers. are actually the ones that contribute the most money to these casinos. And who are actually actively victimized by casinos taking active action to reduce their ability to... Um, to inhibit themselves. And I think that, that there is actually a chemical in your brain that gives you a buzz similar to that of a drug because the rush you get from not knowing what's gonna happen to having the thrill of the risk be at that moment is such that it is comparable to an addiction um, or to a buzz or a drunk or a high that you might get from alcohol or drugs. And so we say that just as the victims of, a, of an addiction are not necessarily making the choice to pursue their addiction, so too are gamblers um, denied their own agency towards the, the, the pursuit of this end. Good. I like that. I like some of the kind of direct, um, the language that he was using to put direct attacks on me in that stage. For example, things like the false assumption on which that argument was based, and you know the the casual way in which you dismiss this idea. All right, those are the things that where you're actually where you're actually attacking what's come out in that sense. It's not you. You're also managing to put forward your own you know alternative information about you know I said oh, um, addiction doesn't matter. And you're putting forward the information that it does. But you're doing it in such a way that that kind of that makes me look like I'm I'm heartless in that sense because I'm just dismissing um, all of these people and the problems that they have in that sense. That's a good um, a good way of, of, of going for the for the jugular in that sense. Right. Okay. So hopefully uh, we'll come to the end of the session now. Um, hopefully when you go into your your next debate, you'll have a bit of a prism to look through to identify where you really need to be um, attacking um, a team um, in order to, to score points. Um, and how to do that in an effective, um, head-on way, in that sense. Um, thank you for getting involved as well. It's a good session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask you for yes. a book with you? Uh, as you've said that uh, gambling has no health issues, it doesn't harm your health. Can we add that you say that uh, it's not only about gambling, every casino has an age limit of what you can enter, and it also includes while you're gambling, they always offer you free drinks, alcohol drinks, there is a lot of women half naked, so it's basically promoting a headless way of life, which is exploiting uh, people from a normal life from their families and leading them into uh, doing alcohol, doing drugs in the casinos. Yeah, so that would that would be a good argument against <coughs> casinos. Yeah. You'd need to also extend a principle to um, why, for example, online poker or something had also had problems about how it took people away from, from families and things, so you make sure that that you're hitting all of them. But I mean, yeah, there's, the thing with rebuttal is there's always loads of yeah. ways of attacking things. Um, it's just what I want you to focus on here is thinking about really how you bring those attacks and really make sure that they hit with as hard force as possible on the other side. Thank you. Thank you.